Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to, um, hang on, I'm in the wrong set of notes. Well, just hang on to that thought. Just get your Bible out, and I'll tell you where to go in a second when I figure it out. Um, I grew up in a pastor's home. My father was a pastor for 38 years. He's a graduate of Tennessee Temple. He's 75 years old, and I retired about five years ago. Uh, he comes back and preaches for me for a month every year. Um, so I grew up in a pastor's home. He pastored one church for 18 years and one church for 20. Um, so I thought entering the ministry that I had a decent concept of ministry. Does that make sense? Any of you in here are pastor's kids? You are? And you are? Missionary? Same difference in the ministry. Um, did your dad pastor a church? Yes. Okay. And yours does too? Yes. All right. So I thought that I had a decent idea of ministry. Uh, and I think that I did in the sense of, of there were a lot of things about ministry that I understood. Of course, I went to Bible college, got a degree for what it's worth, and it is worth something. Um, just the fact of going through and doing the work, and of course, what you learn as well. Um, so when I started into the pastorate, I I'd surrendered to preach when I was 14. I began pastoring when I was 24. So I'd spent 10 years thinking about it very much, and uh, several years in direct preparation of Bible college, growing up in a, you know, in a preacher's home. So I really thought when I started in the ministry that there wouldn't be a lot of things that would surprise me, and I was wrong. Um, and you also need to add it in the mix there, I was typically arrogant. Um, young men, young preachers, there's an old statement that says they're never bigger than when they're first hatched, which is kind of like wasps. And, and, at your, and I'm not criticizing any of you men, I don't know you from Adam, and I hope that you're in better shape than I was at the same age I was your age, but I had an, a natural arrogance to me. And in entering the ministry, I found, to my unpleasant surprise, that I didn't know as much as I thought I knew. And my first few years in ministry were very difficult as a result. Um, for, for several different reasons, but partially because of that, because I thought I knew more than I knew when I started. And when Brother Dameron asked me to teach you fellows this morning, I was sitting outside later that night around my fire. I have a fire pit in the backyard, which is um, very enjoyable for me, and I was sitting there, and I thought to myself about how difficult my first years in the ministry were because of the things I thought I already knew that I didn't. And so this morning for our time together, I just want to give you a number of things that surprised me about the ministry um, so that it, you, know, you can just have those thoughts on your mind and hopefully they might help you. Does that make sense? All right, so number one, uh, it surprised me how much I missed hearing preaching. Now, if you, when, when you enter the ministry, and I don't mean to imply you're not in the ministry now because you're serving God now and I respect that, but you understand how I use that phrase, entering the ministry. Um, when I entered the I was 24 years old when I became a pastor, and um, for the first time in my life, I was not hearing preaching. Um, I had, now if you, when you go into the ministry, if you end up as a youth pastor or a, or a school teacher somewhere, you won't notice this, I don't think as much. But for me, all of a sudden, the only preaching I was hearing was my own. Um, and I, I, it just never occurred to me. I mean, I'd heard 10,000 sermons. from. I grew up in church from the time I was zero to 24. I counted it up one time, just approximately heard about 10,000 sermons. All of a sudden, I'm not getting any of that. And it's my job to give out. And of course, I'm supposed to be getting from the Word of God and from prayer. But I just realized, you know, I just missed hearing preaching. So if you enter the ministry as a pastor right away, um, I would suggest you try to find a way to... to um, I guess cover that lack. Um, I did things like I would read sermons. Before, I never liked to read sermons, but all of a sudden I wasn't hearing them. I liked to read them. I would listen to sermons online, um, and there are thousands of good sermons you can listen to online. Um, I would uh, travel if there was an area church that was having a preacher, like on a Monday or Tuesday or something. Um, I'd drive 120 miles to go hear a preacher, and I'd sit myself in the front row and just get preached at for a while. Um, and uh, so that surprised me, but that's how I handled it. Number two. And by the way, you're not, you're not listening to preaching to get preaching ideas. Because if, you're, if, if what you're doing is trying to listen to preaching to get a list of preaching ideas, then you're not listening for the Lord to speak to your heart. You've heard before, it's the same way about studying the Bible for a sermon. You can study the Bible for a sermon, but that doesn't do anything for your heart, generally speaking. Does that make sense? And I think all of you have heard that before. Number two, it surprised me that preaching on a topic once did not immediately fix the problem. Um, I guess in my naivete when I first started pastoring, 
Okay, part of your job as a, as a preacher, whether you're talking about a youth pastor or a pastor, is to discern what people need. It is to see what they need and to address it in preaching. Um, when I first began preaching, I, I did not preach expositorily at all. So every single sermon was topically based. So I had to come up with a new topic every sermon. Now about two thirds of my preaching is expository, but I still preach a fair amount of topical. And so you have to discern what, you have to choose what you're gonna preach, but you discern it based on what do these people need. So it surprised me that, I, okay, I could spot what I thought this family needed or what this man needed or my church was weak in this area, and I would preach on it and then I would expect it to get better. And it didn't. And it wasn't because the preaching wasn't the truth, it's because you can't just preach on something one time and everybody falls into line. It just doesn't work that way. Um, it's something that Clarence Sexton said, to, said one time, he said to me, he said, you reap a harvest where you place an emphasis. And that's such an important statement in relation to pastoring because you decide what it is you want to reap, and that's what you've got to sow. Ron Royalty, I've heard him say that a thousand times. You reap more than you sow, you reap after you sow, you, know, you reap the same thing you sow. So if you want to reap, if you want to have a soul winning church and you don't, you can't just preach on soul winning once and expect everybody to show up on Saturday morning. Does that make sense? It, it is something that you have to place a continued emphasis on. You have to decide what, what you're going to emphasize, but it's got to be something that you attack from several different angles and do it repeatedly. You can't just preach something once and expect it to be solved. Um, number three, it surprised me. <laughs> I just hate to admit some of the stuff on this list. Um, it surprised me when my amazing preaching did not draw the crowds in. And this is where you see my arrogance. Um, I really thought I was a good preacher. Um, I thought I was a better preacher than my dad. Um, I thought I was a better preacher than the area pastors around where I lived. I thought I was a better preacher than most people had ever heard in my church. And <laughs> I know I can't believe the words that are coming out of my mouth, but it's true. So I thought that all I had to do to get a church grow, to grow would be to stand up and be the second coming of Billy Sunday. And people would just, they'd walk out, they'd say, I've never heard such an amazing preacher and I'm gonna go tell my friends we're gonna all come back and my crowd's just gonna go like this. You say, how could you be so stupid? I don't know exactly. But it was good for me that it didn't happen. Um, it, it, God took, and I think the best way to describe the first few years of my ministry was God just took my face and ground it into the dirt. Um, my first Sunday as a pastor, I had 11 people. I took over from a man. Sometimes I say I started the church, and that is rather realistic. There was, the church had no address. The building they were in had no address. They were in debt. They were renting space. They had no membership list, no Sunday school classes, no phone number. Um, a guy had tried to start a church there for 10 years, and that's what he had, and he handed it to me. They were either going to close or I was going to be the pastor. So I figured at the age of 24, I couldn't hurt it any because it was going to close anyway. So in a year's time, we grew from 11 to 8. I'm talking about our biggest service. I have preached dozens of times to less people than are in this room right now. Probably a dozen times I showed up to church, turned the lights on, which I was paying for out of my own pocket, um, and, well not showed up, I lived in the building, I lived in an office room that was as big as those two closets combined, and, and not a soul showed up for church. I wasn't even married, so I didn't have a guaranteed person to show up. So uh, probably, probably 50 times I've preached to two old ladies, one sitting over there and one sitting over there. And in the process of that, God, I came out of Bible college thinking that I was a great preacher and I was gonna build a big church. And you know what God did? He humbled me and it was good for me. Um, but that surprised me. It surprised me that my great preaching did not draw in the crowds. Number four. It surprised me to learn that God was more interested in what I was becoming than he was in what I accomplished. I'll say that again. It surprised me that God was more interested in what I was becoming than he was in what I accomplished. Um, 
Growing up, I was motivated in the ministry by the idea that, you know, America needs pastors and we need good churches and we need to reach people and there's nothing wrong with that kind of motivation. But what it did, one of the side effects of it, one of the negative side effects of it was it, it built a mindset in me I didn't even notice that God needed me. Does God need me? Does God need you? Does God need Fairhaven Baptist College? Does God need anything? No. So it wasn't my, my ability to preach a good sermon, my ability to build a church, my ability to, to minister to people and teach people the Word of God. God didn't need any of that. Do you know what God's purpose in your life is? What is God's whole design for your life? Yes, sir? That is partially the answer, but it's not the answer. Yes, sir? To glorify Him, I like that answer, and the Presbyterians would like that answer. Um, the chief end of man is to enjoy God and, and, and to glorify Him forever. Um, take your Bibles, go to, go to Ephesians chapter 1. Been preaching through Ephesians on Wednesday nights for the past year. Just a just a rich book. Look, please, at verse number. Uh, look at verse number verse number nine. Having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure which He hath purposed in Himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. The principle behind that passage is that Jesus' purpose is to, is to bring back what the devil, to change what the devil did, and to bring it all back into submission to Jesus Christ, to make it all holy. Is the earth cursed? Why? Sin. Sin. So redemption's job is, I'm cursed because of sin, you're cursed because of sin. The earth. So redemption's job is to redeem all of that back into the control of Jesus Christ, including you and I. Go to Romans chapter 8. I wasn't planning on going into this, but just give you just a quick word on this. Look at verse number uh, 29. This is one of those passages the Calvinists are completely wrong about, and there's a number of them in the Word of God, but look at verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, does God know everything ahead of time? Yes. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. What's that word predestinate mean? Predetermined. All right. So Calvinists look at this passage and they say God predetermined ahead of time who was going to get saved and who wasn't. So does God know ahead of time who's going to get saved and who, who doesn't? Yes. But predestination is never used in the New Testament in the context of who's going to get saved and who doesn't. In other words, God did not predetermine ahead of time that you're going to trust Christ and you're going to go to hell. What did He predestine? What did He predestine us about? For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. God knew I was going to get saved ahead of time. And since he knew that, he predetermined that someday I'm going to be just like Christ. Now that day is not going to come until I get to heaven. Of course, in the process in between time, I should be growing toward that. But God's purpose in my life is to form me into the image of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Because, let me say that again. God's purpose in my life is to form me into the image of Jesus Christ. His purpose for my life is not for me to build a big church. Now along the way, if I build a big church and help a lot of people, is that bad? No, it's a wonderful thing. If I witness, some a brother mentioned witness, if I witness, I reach a lot of people for Christ. Is that a good thing? Absolutely. Is it a scriptural thing? Absolutely. But what is God's purpose in my life? To form me into the image of Jesus Christ. To form everything into the image of Jesus Christ so it's all holy again. Because I understand that now and I didn't understand it then, I thought that God would be, that God would be impressed with how much I did for Him. God, what God wants from me is not what I do. What He wants from me is what I'm becoming. 
God uses the ministry to help me become like Christ. I'm not saying I'm wasting my time in ministry. I'm saying that my, my focus cannot be, what have I accomplished? It's got to be, am I becoming more like Jesus Christ? Because if my focus is on what I accomplished, then my measurement of success becomes how many people are in church, how many people got baptized, how many people showed up for soul winning. My measure of success becomes accomplishment. You know, the Bible only uses the word success one time. Where is it? Who said Joshua? Joshua chapter 1, right? Then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, then thou shalt have good success. Every word in the Bible is there on purpose. Success for Joshua was not conquering all the land of Canaan. Success for Joshua was to be obedient to God's will for him. Uh, Alfred Edersheim is a 19th century um, Jewish man who got saved and uh, became a pastor of a little church in the middle of nowhere. But he wrote the best book I've ever read. Um, the Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. I've read it several times. It changed my life as I read it and studied it. But Alfred Edersheim was the first person to ever teach me that the outstanding characteristic of Jesus' life was that he always did what his Heavenly Father wanted. I used to think the outstanding characteristic of Jesus' life was that he could do miracles. When you look at his life, well, look what he could do. And he could do miracles. But when you look at his life, he said, I do all, John chapter 8, I do always those things that please the Father. I'm supposed to be like Jesus, and Jesus is more concerned about what I am becoming as a Christian than he is in what I accomplish. All right, I'm teaching you men a little bit about pastoring this morning. God's more interested that I'm holy this morning than that I do a good job teaching you. I didn't understand that when I started ministry. I thought that, well, I tell you what, God needs me to do this and accomplish this. And are you following me? If you're not, just write it down anyway, and God will teach it to you. Number four. Number five, it surprised me that, it's just amazing how much surprised me because I knew so much when I started. <laughs> it surprised me that people you pastored and loved would leave your church without a word of explanation. It surprised me that people you loved and pastored would leave your church without even a word of explanation. I think we were talking yesterday, and you said, Brother Dameron, that in your mind, the word shepherd is the best word for pastor. And of course, the word shepherd is what the word pastor means. The word pastor literally means shepherd. When you are the right kind of a pastor, you care deeply for your people. If you don't, you're a bad pastor. When you care deeply for them, and you minister to them, and you serve them, and you love them, and then they just walk away without a word, I just thought that they wouldn't, I understood people leave a church sometimes, I'd seen people leave our church when I was growing up as a kid, but my dad never told me that sometimes they leave and never tell him why. To this day I have people, I, I don't lose a lot of people, I'm not the kind of a pastor that has a high turnover in my church, but of course I've still lost people through the years, in 19 years of pastoring, and some of them to this day have never told me why. You can call them up, you can knock on their door, you can try to get them to talk to you, but they can dodge you and just never even do you the courtesy of saying, here's why I'm leaving. Which leads then to number six. It surprised me how much it hurt when they left. It surprised me how much it hurt when they left. Some men, it doesn't seem to hurt them when they lose people. Maybe, maybe it does and they just want to act macho and I know preachers like that, that well, bless God, which is a curse phrase. Uh, you do understand that, right? If you take God's name in Well, bless God, you know, just l let the good old, let the, let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. We don't need you anymore. That's just a lousy approach to pastoring. If I'm going to pastor correctly, I'm going to care for those people. And if I care for them, I'm going to hurt when they leave. And that surprised me how much it hurt. I can still tell you almost everybody that ever left my church, pastor two churches, almost everybody that ever left that was a core member of my church. And it still hurts years later. And it's not something... If you get to the place in the ministry where you get over that, you've gotten to the wrong place in the ministry. Because you've got to care for people. And that means you've got to hurt. Um, number seven. 
It surprised me to learn that leadership is not commanding. Leadership is serving. <laughs> I went to Bible college at a very big church, and the pastor, um, he'd walk in when it was time to preach. Security would walk in with him. He would preach, and as he walked out, security would gather around him. If you wanted to see him, you had to go stand in a long line of people on a Sunday night to see him. Um, I talked to him maybe four, five, maybe five, six times personally in the six years I was there at Bible College. And one of the bad things that taught me is when you go to Bible College in a big church, your concept of the pastor is the pastor is the one who tells everybody what to do. Now, does the pastor have to be the boss? Sure. In fact, the word bishop in the New Testament is a word for boss, and it's one of the three words used in the New Testament for pastor. He has to be the boss. He has to be the administrator. He has to say yes for this and no for that, and you have to do some of that. But I came out with a mindset that as a pastor, my job was to tell people what to do. But you can't lead that way. My first Sunday, when I stood up, my first pulpit was a cardboard box covered over with a bathroom rug on top of a school desk about like this. That was my first pulpit. When I stood behind that pulpit the first Sunday, I had 11 people, look, 10 people looking at me, 11, 11 people looking at me. They're not college students. They're not staff members. I'm going to preach to them, but they're not going to do what I tell them. In fact, sometimes, they'll, not sometimes, the majority of the time, they'll come to me for counsel, and they still won't do what I tell them. And boy, is that frustrating. But, uh, okay, what is leadership? Give me a definition of leadership. Give me a description of leadership. To guide by way of example. To guide by way of example. That's a good definition. I like that. The idea of setting the example, of course, is very biblical. And to guide means to move them along. The best, word, the best uh, two very good descriptions of leadership I've heard, one is to create in others the desire to follow you. It is to make somebody want to do what you want them to do, not to make them do it. Dictatorship is not leadership, it's dictatorship. There's a total difference. But the single best word for leadership is influence. I want to influence my church members to become like Christ. I want to move them in that direction. With every church member I have, I can tell you exactly what area of the Christian life I'm trying to get them to work on. They don't know that, but every single one, I have an estimate of where they're at spiritually and what's the next step I want them to take. And I want to move them in that direction. But for me to move them in that direction, if I want to get them from here to here, I'm not going to get them to move from this part of the Christian life to this part of the Christian life by telling them to do it. I've got to make them want to go. And to make them want to go, I've got to serve them. I, what did Jesus say? Who's the greatest? He that is chief among you, the book of Mark said, he that is chief among you, let him be your servant. Let him be your minister. Minister and the word servant. One passage uses that in Matthew, uses the word servant. The other in Mark uses the word minister. So if I'm going to be the chief of my church, I've got to be serving them. You know, if I want to get, tell me your name again. Michael. If I want to get Michael to stop wearing blue shirts, that's my spiritual goal in his life. If I wanted to get him to stop wearing blue shirts, if he's a member of my church, I can't walk up to him and say, you can't wear blue shirts to our church again. What's he going to do? Nothing. <laughs> he's going to laugh at me and wear his blue shirt then more. Because he's a man. right? I don't have any authority over him in that sense. I've got to somehow make him want to not wear blue shirts anymore. You know how I'm going to make him want to do that? If I serve him so well, he loves me so much, he does it because he loves me and trusts me and listens to me. And you don't build that kind of a relationship with your church people unless you're serving them. That's why you go to the hospital in the middle of the night. That's why you, you, even though you've preached three sermons on Sunday and you're exhausted, some lady wants to see you and you give her another hour of your time because she's struggling with cancer and she's facing death and she doesn't know how to deal with it. 
That's why you serve. You serve because in serving, you're ministering to the needs of people, and they in turn will grant you the opportunity to influence them to move in the direction you want them to go. Leadership is not me telling my church people what to do. Leadership is finding a way to make them want to do what I want them to do. And they give me that when I serve them well and love them well. Does that make sense? Um, my oldest child is 14 years old. And as children become teenagers, when children are small, you can command them. But now my 14-year-old is taller than me, which is not a great accomplishment in life. Um, Spurge and I, both great preachers, both short, both beards, both stocky. That's clinging on to that. Um, so when my, when, my, my, when my son was two years old and he disobeyed me, I could spank him and make him do what I want him to do. But now he's 14 and he's bigger than me. He goes to the gym and he lifts more than I lift. And he has a black belt in Taekwondo, which took him four and a half years to get. He just got it this spring. He really honestly could just tear me up if he wanted to. So if I'm going to move now my 14-year-old in the direction I want him to go, if I just keep commanding him at some point, that man part of him is going to rise up and say, I'm not doing what you tell me anymore. I don't have to. You can't make me. That's why Solomon said when he wrote Proverbs, there's so much wisdom there. He said, my son, give me thy heart. He said, love me, because if you love me, I can lead you and I can influence you. I can help you. I can minister to you. But you, you have to get to the place when someone is mature, where you're not just telling them what to do, your children, not just telling them what to do, but you're leading them. What was it you said by example? To guide by example. Well, that's what it's like as a, as a pastor. You can't just tell people. I, I had a guy my church, first couple years I pastored, he came to church and he hadn't shaved. And... Uh, he just, looked, he just looked ratty, and he was supposed to take the offering. And uh, I was living in the church building at the time. I walked him back to my little room. I handed him a shaving can, and I, a can of shaving cream, and I handed him a razor. I said, don't you take the offering until you shave. Now, I wanted him to look clean cut, but that was out of line. Now, if that's the approach you want to take to pastoring, you go ahead and take that approach to pastoring, but that is a really tough row to hoe. And it's not the Jesus way. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, write it down. It will later. Number nine. Oh, number eight. It surprised me to realize nobody in my church or outside my church would care about my church as much as I did. surprised me to learn that nobody in my church or outside my church would care about my church as much as I did. Now that statement sounds arrogant, doesn't it? It sounds like I love this church more than anybody. I'm better at it. One of my, one of my, one of my professors in Bible college used to say, nobody will carry the burden like you do. Is anybody here a bus captain? All right, is anybody here a Sunday school teacher? You are? What, what, tell me a little bit about your class. What age is it? It's only back from my, I teach the teenagers. You teach the teenagers? <coughs> All right. So do you teach the teenagers by yourself, or do you split that with somebody else? It's just me. It's just you. All right. Now, I'm not saying that nobody else in the church loves those teenagers, but nobody else will have the same heartbeat for, you, for that class like you do because nobody else is the teacher. It surprised me to learn that I would care about my church more than anybody did. The people in my church, to them, my church was a part of their life. But to me, my church was my whole life. My friends in the ministry, they cared about my church, but they had their own churches, and they cared about their churches more than they cared about my church. It, you say, what does that have to do with anything? Because I felt lonely. I felt like... How come nobody cares about this? I'd have a good Sunday, and it was like nobody cared. I'd have an awful Sunday, and it was like nobody cared. And I, I wanted to scream at the world, doesn't anybody care what I'm doing? Well, the harsh answer was, no. <laughs> they don't. And that was hard for me to deal with for a while. 
Now, again, when I started pastoring, I wasn't even married. I didn't get married until two and a half years later. So I didn't even have, and my wife and I were a close team. And I, I, I'm not gone from her very much. I miss her very much today. She, she does much work at our church. I tease her that, you know, she's the co-pastor and people, I wish we could just put that on the sign so we could get two salaries. Um, <laughs> but we're too baptistic to do that. But, but my wife cares about our church as much as I do. You know, she, she cares about this person and this family and where they're at spiritually and the disastrous choices they're making and this area of the church is doing well and this area of the church is doing poorly. She ministers with me. We're a team, really. But I didn't have her when I started. I had nobody. And I struggled with the fact that this church was my whole life and nobody else really cared about it. Number nine... Of course, I was wrong. Who cares about that church as much as I do? In fact, he cares about it more than I do. See, nobody carries a burden like Jesus does. He loves those teenagers in that class even more than you do. He loves this hard for you, man, if you don't. Do you have children? No. I'm sorry. It's a wonderful thing to have children sometimes. Um, but he cares about my children more than I care about my children. He cares about my church people more than I do. And you have to find, I didn't put this in my notes, but you have to learn to find your, your, your comfort, your solace in God. That he cares as much as you do and he's the one you go to. Look at, go to Psalm 62. Let me show you a psalm that I have read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times because it ministers to my soul. Psalms is my favorite book of the Bible. Um, and I've read it the most and preached from it the most, I think. Look at verse number one. Truly my soul waiteth upon God, from him cometh my salvation. So who's the psalmist waiting on? God. He's not waiting on a girlfriend. He's not waiting on a church. He's not waiting on a phone call from a pulpit committee. He's not waiting on, you know, a promotion at work. He's waiting on God. He's looking to God. Verse 2, he only, see that word only? What an exclusive word that is. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will you imagine mischief against a man? You shall be slain all of you as a bowing wall. Shall you be as a tottering fence? The idea is that my enemies are about to collapse and they don't even know it. God's about to bring judgment on them. Verse 4, they only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Now, verse 5 is my favorite verse in the whole Bible. My soul, wait thou. What's the next word? Upon who? For my expectation is from, if I expect, if I have an expectation from anybody else in the world, at some point I'm going to be what? I'm going to be disappointed. So if I expect my wife to understand me completely, I'm going to be, if I expect my friends from Bible college to help me get the job in the ministry I want, I'm going to be, if I expect my church members to care about my church as much as I do, I'm going to be. You say you sound gloomy. No, I'm not. I'm saying you have to put your expectation just on God. When you put your expectation just on God, you have, an expect, you have someone who will never disappoint you. You never will. All right, number next. I don't know what number I'm on. Ten. It surprised me that what actually built my church was not me. I'll give you the rest of the sentence in just a moment, but let's just stop there for a moment. It surprised me that what built my church was not me. Remember I said when I came out of Bible college, I thought I was a great preacher. And so I thought that my, that, that my, my style of preaching would make people so interested they would just flock in. So I thought I was going to build the church. I had all kinds of classes in college, maybe not specific classes, but teaching in college. You're going to do this to build your church. You're going to do this to build your church. You're going to do this to build your church. And none of that teaching was wrong, but it left me with a mindset because it wasn't counterbalanced. It left me with a mindset that guess who's going to build my church? I am. We were talking yesterday about Lee Robertson's famous statement, of which there's some truth. Everything rises and falls on. Well, I guess you guys don't know it. <laughs> Do you know who Lee Robertson was? 
Lee Robertson pastored the uh, Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee for over 40 years and built it up to run about 10,000 in Sunday school, started Tennessee Temple University. It was a great independent fundamental Baptist in the, in the 20th century. Lee Robertson very famously said, everything rises and falls on leadership. And I took the, and there's some truth to that, but, it, but I took that idea that I am going to take this little, the previous pastor tried to start that church was a failure, I'm not gonna be a failure, I'm smarter than him, I'm, I'm more disciplined than him, I'm a better preacher than him, I'm gonna lead this church to new heights. But it wasn't me. Now that church built, it grew slowly. <laughs> it took me seven years to get from 10 people to 50 people, but it grew. When I came to Chicago 13 years ago, we had 40 people, now we have 100. It grew, but it wasn't me that built that church. Jesus said to Peter, he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Who builds the church? Christ does. Now, does he use things I do as a pastor? Yes. And I can't go off too far on the other side of the road and say, well, nothing's my responsibility and all my job is is to get up and preach and then it's God's job to take care of everything else because that's a, that's a, a case of rasara, whatever will be, will be. It's a lackadaisical approach to ministry. It takes no responsibility. It takes no accountability. It just, just blames God for everything for the fact the church is not doing well. Well, I can't do that either because God uses men. God uses means. God uses methods. But who's doing the work? You're taking notes with that pen. So what's writing? You or the pen? The pen is. The pen is. Can I see your pen for a second? Is it writing now? No, sir. Is it the same pen it was a minute ago? How come it's not writing if the pen's writing? You understand? This pen, in order to be used to, be, to be accomplish anything, has to be yielded to the control of your hand. So without your hand, without the power coming through your hand in the direction of your mind, it doesn't matter how well it writes, it'll sit there and not do a thing. I'm the pen. God's hand is your hand. God's hand is the one that uses me, that moves me. But who does the work? It's God that does the work. I yield myself to him and he does the work. So let me go back to the rest of the statement. It surprised me that what actually built my church was not me. It was perseverance love in the Word of God. I could give you a lot more there, but those were three things that came to my mind as I was staring into my fire late at night thinking about you men. It was perseverance, love, and the, and the Word of God. I did so many things wrong in my first church, um, but it worked. It got to the place where it, I worked Full -time, a full-time job the first five years I was a pastor. Then the last two years there, we were, I was able to be a full-time pastor. We bought a building, paid for it, and they supported me just enough for me to live. That church is still in existence today. It's got about 75 people. It's got a good pastor. It's still reaching that town, and, and, and I'm, it's one of the things I'm most pleased about in life, that it's still continuing on. But somebody asked me one time, why did that church in, in Be Bessemer, Bessemer, Pennsylvania, the, the center of town is a stop sign. There's 1,100 people in the whole town. Why, why did that church work? And the, the human answer is, I just didn't quit. So when I went from 11 to 8 in one year, I didn't quit. You know, when I had, it was time for church and there was nobody there, I didn't quit. When it was just two ladies, I didn't quit. Um, when, when I couldn't get anybody saved and baptized and there was no sense of momentum and there was no excitement and every single service was depressing, I didn't quit. When I no piano player for an entire, what, two year period, I didn't quit. To take the offertory, I had to press play on the cassette, take the offertory so I could walk out there with the offering plate. You don't quit. Because if you quit, you never accomplish what it is God's building with your life. But now wait a minute, because I didn't quit, does that mean I built that church? No, it means God could use me to build that church. All right, so perseverance, love. What builds a church of people who will follow you is if you love them. 
There are some men whose style of ministry is to be bombastic, to be charismatic personality, to build a church because people want to come and watch them. John Wesley, I think it was, very famously said, I set myself on fire and people come to watch me burn. But John Wesley was never a pastor. He was an evangelist. And uh, in order for me to pastor people, I'm not good enough. I'm not one of those men that just attracts people and they flood in. In order for me to pastor, I've got to love those people. And if I love them, what are they going to do back? Love back. First John chapter 4 says we love him because he first loved us. People respond with what you give them. When you give them the respect, they'll give you respect back. When you give them loyalty, they'll give you loyalty back. When you give them love, they'll give you love back. When you give them grief, they'll give you grief back. One of the statements about pastoring is that the congregation will return to you in floods what you give in vapors, that, that you give this and they're going to give it back to you. So if I want my church to love me, which I need them to do in order to let them influence me, how am I going to get them to love me? I'm going to love them, but wait a minute. Can I love them with my own love? Am I love? No. Who's love? 1 John chapter 4 again. One of the three great chapters in the Bible on, on the love of God. God is love. So if I'm going to love them, Romans chapter 5 says that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. It's not my love that gets people to love me. It lets them lead me. It's the love of God flowing through me to them. And in return, they will love me back. And that lets me influence them and lead me. People want to be cared about. There's an old statement that says, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. That's one of the things that hurts me in trying to teach you men today because I don't know you and you don't know me. And so we have no personal relationships. So, so much of what I'm saying, you have no background of my life and my attitude towards you. And so you've got to sort of take me at face value. And it's hard to influence people unless you have a relationship with them. But in pastoring, you're going to have a continuing relationship with them. If you love them, they will follow you. But it's God through you that loves them. So it wasn't me that built the church. It was perseverance, love, and what was the last thing I gave you? The Word of God. It's not my philosophy that changes people's lives. My words have no power unless the Holy Spirit empowers them. And the Holy Spirit empowers them as I'm preaching and teaching what? God's Word. And that's why I came to the place where I preach so much, expo such, a, such a, almost two-thirds of my preaching is expository because I just want to give them the Word of God. You know what people need? They need to know what God thinks. They don't need to know what Tom Brennan thinks. So my job in preaching is to find out what God thinks and tell people this is what God thinks. My preaching over the, I've been a pastor 19 years, it's so different than it was when I started. When I started, I wanted to tell people what I thought and find a verse that went along with that. You know, I think that you're wrong because you're wearing a blue shirt, so let me find a verse that goes along with that to change your mind. But I've changed my whole approach to pastoring now. Now it's not you've got a blue shirt and I want to change your mind. Now it's, okay, here's what God said and I'm going to give it to you. It's God, it, you, you study the, the, the Word of God about what the Bible says about itself. It's the Word of God that changes people's hearts. It's the Holy Spirit using the Word of God that convicts them and comforts them and encourages them and motivates them and guides them and leads them and develops them to be like who? Not like me. Now they need to follow me, and Paul was clear about that in the New Testament, repeatedly saying, follow me as I follow Christ. But remember, God's purpose in their life is to form them into the image of Christ. So it's not my thinking or my philosophy that they need to adjust to. It is the Word of God. So then my job as a pastor in preaching is, to, is as best I know how, and God is my witness, I work hard at this, to study what does the Word of God say, and I get up and preach, and here's what the Word of God says. And that's what builds a church. My pastor in Bible college, he used to say, so many people think it's humor that built this church or my personality that built this church. He said it is the Word of God that built this church. And the proof of the fact he was right is when he died, it didn't go down in attendance. If it was all about him, it would have gone down. But it was built on the Word of God. Um, and that's what builds churches. Perseverance and love in the Word of God. And of course, God uses all of those.
All right, number 11. Don't forget, you gotta ask me a question before we get out. So you best be thinking about it. Number 11, it surprised me that I would struggle with pastoral envy. <laughs> it wasn't that I thought I was perfect. It's that I, th it's that I thought I was better. And so the idea that I would struggle with envy. Growing up, I never envied anybody because I was smarter than everybody I went to school with. I never studied for a test in my life. So I never envied. They envied my ability not to have to study. I didn't have to envy them. I was athletic in our, in our little Christian school league. I was all-star point guard. I didn't envy them. They envied me. At least that's what I thought. But when I got into the ministry, I discovered that envy lurks in my heart, too. And uh, a friend of mine I went to school with, he took a church in Kentucky, and he asked me to come preach for him. And so I went down to preach for him. And uh, he took me out to eat with an area pastor and the area pastor's assistant pastor. So I'm about 25, 26 years old. I'm still just really wet behind the ears as a pastor. And the four of us are sitting around a table and as I looked at the conversation after the conversation was over, it dawned on me that every one of us envied somebody else. At that point in my ministry, I wanted to be a full-time pastor, and I envied the man sitting across the table from me who was my friend who, had a, who was a full-time pastor. He was envying the guy next to him who had a bigger church than him. And the assistant pastor to that guy was envying me because he wanted to be a pastor. This guy envied me, I envied him, he envied him. It is, you say, that's awful. That's human nature. I have struggled in my ministry with, with envy in my heart over another guy's church building. My building right now seats 106 people. The pews go all the way to the wall. I cannot put any more people in that building. And it's going to cost me millions of dollars to build or buy another building in the city of Chicago. So I go, this church has an attached parking lot. I'd give my left arm for an attached parking lot. My parking lot's a block away. I have to put people, drive people back and forth in a shuttle van. You get ticketed if you park in front of my church building at the wrong time, even if you're a member of my church building. I could go on and on and on with all the problems I have where I pastor that some other pastor doesn't have. You know what that is? That's envy. I envy this guy's the fact that he has a secretary and I don't. Till I got a secretary, then I envied the fact that guy has an assistant pastor and I don't. You say, you're a lousy Christian. I'm a, I, I, I'm, I'm a sinner is what I am. And it surprised me to see that in my heart. Um, and I'm glad the Holy Spirit let me see that in my heart so that he could work with me about it. Um, so how do I deal with envy very quickly? Um, uh, I confess it. Um, I have the patience of taking the long view, and I don't have time to expand on that. And I try to remember we're on the same team. The brother in Christ whose building is bigger than mine that I envy, he's not, we're not in competition. We're on the same team. We're on God's team. Number 12, it surprised me how deeply and fiercely I love what I do. I would not change my role in life as a pastor of people if you offered me a million dollars. I just, I love my church. I love I, the fact I get to study the Word of God, that I get to teach and preach the Word of God, that I get to counsel people. Yes, there's aggravation in ministry. Yes, there's sorrow in ministry. Yes, there's grief in ministry. But I love my life. I live right next to, the, to, to, where I, to where I pastor. I live in the house next door. I, I, go, home for, I'm, I go home for lunch. My kids are homeschooled. We, we're, we're in the, we eat the same, around the same table 20 times a week. You know, it's, it's I love my life. And I was just surprised that God would let me just enjoy serving Him so much, which goes back to the Presbyterians of enjoying God and glorifying Him forever. They were right about that. So there you go, 12 things that surprised me. Those things I thought, now again, there are a lot of things about, about the ministry that I knew when I started and I was right, but there was a whole lot I didn't know, and I thought some of that might help you.